crazy. And then it's even crazier for, for, for pediatrics, okay? Which will kind of nail the point as to why it's such a big deal when kids get dehydrated. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Here, here for a second. Just the four important um, cations that we need to be aware of, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Cool. And we're going to talk about the, the flip side of that as well. Piggybacking, that was the percentage that really broke it down for me that it was 60%. And then you think of how much... Like, I've seen the field of people just pushing a ton of fluid and how much that washes out with the percentage is actually Yeah, good. What else? I thought the signs, the signs of uh, pediatric and the age were like the patient. I have a little girl. Yep. What else? No, I'm not done yet. What else? profiles were interesting and that it seems like it's hypertonic for the most part you said that it's going to pull fluid into the vascular space and yep. it's hypotonic yep. it's going to go the other way. Yep. And so if you put that back into what we were talking, the context of what we were talking about yesterday afternoon, we talked about isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic and solutions that we give, I mean solutions that we give, medication, right? Only this, on the other hand, is what the body does for itself. So we're just mimicking, when we, when we do our thing, we're just mimicking what the body's trying to do already. Us, um, our, our, our part in that is very, very small and, and minute. All right, so let's talk. This, this is where we're going. Um, we're going to talk about the role of water. You've already told me a little bit about that, and so we're going to we're going to kind of hammer that a little bit. We're going to talk about the the cations and anions in terms of electrolytes, and we're going to talk about what happens in terms of electrolyte imbalance. Um, you should know it already, but the idea that water is the most abundant substance in the body, bar none. So the idea the idea that our body is in this continuous motion, uh, not only taking water but giving off in urine and, and feces as well for that balance. Water plays a part in the homeostasis. Duh, you should know that, right? Water is considered the universal solvent for a variety of solutes. What's the difference? Solvent and solute. What is that? Solute is what you're all talking about. Yeah, it's uh, more like a solid type item. Okay. Okay, so solutes is, or uh, excuse me, uh, solvent is water, in this case, what we're talking about. It's other, it's plasma as well, and the like and other stuff. But in, in its most famous form, it is water, what we're talking about. Solute is your electrolytes and glucose and some other things as well. To what you were telling me, 60% of our total body weight is water. In the pediatric population, that's 80%. And pediatrics, in this case, is, de is defined as being eight years or less. Of the further breakdown, 45% of the 60% is intracellular fluid. So in other words, fluid that's found within the cell. 50% is extracellular, so outside of the cell. And the further breakdown of the extracellular then is 10.5% of interstitial and another 4.5% intravascular. It'd be good to know those numbers. So what does that say to you up there? We were, we were kind of touched on it already, but what does that say to you? So the idea that when you're thirsty, you're thirsty for a reason. It isn't just because one day you wake up and say, I think we're going to be thirsty today. The idea that when you're thirsty, the body is saying that we need some, some more um, water or solvent in terms of maintaining that homeostasis. Vice versa, that if, if we've had too much um, water, the idea that you can't have water poisoning uh, by taking too much water along the way, 
Um, it works in the opposite direction. The body will react in that direction to try to get rid of all that fluid that's on board. So this is a different way of looking at that. 75% of our total um, body water comes from intracellular, 25% comes from extracellular. So that's a further breakdown to the extracellular, 17.5 interstitial or plasma, 7.5 intravascular fluid. So the idea in terms of both sides of, of a cell membrane, intracellular and extracellular. So there's two different ways of looking at it. This is the total. This is the total percentage. Okay. This, on the other hand, is the total body weight. So total body weight versus total percentage. Okay. Yeah. Every every time every time I do this lecture, there's there's a lot of confusion in terms uh, in terms of numbers. Okay. So just a wee bit different in terms of two different ways of looking at it. That's all it is. Can you go back? I can. Today, because tomorrow we're camping. There. What's an ion? It's a charge electron. So, give an example of how that works. In a perfect world, how would you define ion if you were talking to somebody else about it? The molecule that gets disassociated leaves positive or negative charged ions or electrons uh, within the solid unit. So, a great example to that, and you're, you're, you're spot on with that. So a great example of that is you, if you take something and you put it into water, it's going to either become positive or negative in nature, which is essentially what goes on with electrolytes in terms of cations and anions um, that, that is, it's, it's moving the fluid, it's either going to get positive charge or negative charge. So that's where we're going. So tomorrow we're going to talk about ions in the sense that 
Um, electrons are a negative charge, neutrons are a neutral charge, protons are a pro positive charge, okay? If you're, having, if you're having trouble in terms of thinking about that, the, the idea in terms of electrons is always associated with the negative side, protons, positive charge. So help me out in terms of this. What does this mean in the, in the bigger scheme of things? What does this mean in terms of the body system? Good. That, that's a start. What else about it? That's part of it as well, and that's where we're going tomorrow. What else about it? What do you mean? That's it right there. That's it. That's exactly what's going on. The heart is probably the, the best example of that, but there's different systems that counteract each other on both sides both, both sides of this, okay? Um, cations and anions are, are opposite sides of each other, but related to each other. They're like, they're like cousins, if you will. And we'll, we'll kind of point that out here in just a couple of minutes. The idea in terms of the body functions because of that, specifically the heart, you have this sodium-potassium um, pump, you have several other so-called pumps throughout the body that are uh, that are about this right here. So it's calcium gold is positive though, right? Hang on to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I promise we'll come back to that. So electrolytes are substances that form ions when they break down or dissociate in water, i.e. salt. They are cap capable of conducting an electrical charge, which the body needs in terms of the nervous system, in terms of the cardiac system, and in terms of a lot of other systems, in terms of function of life. So cations, positive charge, anions, negative charge. I'll let you write and then we'll talk. Let's think about this for just a wee bit. Is sodium a huge thing as far as the heart goes? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is phosphate a, 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 a anion that's kind of important to the cardiac side? No. Yes. 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 So they're, they're cousins, if you will, in terms of taking care of the heart. Let's suppose the sodium is on the ceiling in terms of the number. But the phosphate is not so much so. What's going to happen in terms of that heart? Is the electrical conduction system going to be messed up because of that? Yes. So the idea in terms of when electrolytes are out of whack, when our patients um, are sick either with, with potassium, high potassium, high or low sodium along the way, that has a bearing in terms of what happens here, in fact, this case right here. You know this. Major cations include sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Have any biochem majors in here, then you can probably get up and, and, and tell us about it. But other than that, not so much. Yeah. Is it in this order? Like the no. most is sodium? No. 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 But the one that gets talked about, obviously, is sodium. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that the, the, they're, 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 uh, they're all equal in the season. You can't have one without the other. Can I go? It 
does. Not as much so as the other ones, but it does. It plays a part both in muscle and in, in, uh, in heart. So later on, when we're talking about corsades as being like an electrical thing, usually it's deficiency in terms of magnesium. That's the one of the possibilities. So you'll we'll hear more about that. Just not as much as the other one. Okay? Can I go? All right, so sodium. Most abundant extracellular cation. Responsible for maintaining fluid balance in the body. Other functions include important, um, importance of transmission of nervous impulses, muscle contraction, and neurotransmission transfer of calcium into the cell. So it does a lot. It's a whirlpool. So again, back to your question, Josh, the, the idea that they're all equal and yet sodium is kind of like the left ventricle, the workhorse of, of all this. Where salt goes, water will follow, would be a good concept to know. Okay, so as you, as, as you think about the loop of penalty, as you think about the nephrons that, that we've gotten into that we'll come back to, the idea that it plays a part in terms of water being shifted off or not, depending on what's going on with electrolytes, specifically sodium. When salt is retained, water is also retained. Normal range for, you don't need to know the range, but just, just out there, normal range is 135 to 146 in a lab setting. So a low side of that is called hyponephemia. High side of that is called hypernephemia. You will hear that in your patient population. You will see that, especially AMR folk with interfacility type trans, transports. You will hear and see that in action. How do you say that whatever the Mill equivalents. The M M Q is that what you're talking about? Mill equivalents. So all they're saying, all they're saying is that is that um, the the idea that when you think about the nephrons and everything else like that being given off, glucose will also try to follow wherever this is going as well. So it's not just it's not just specifically sodium and water. It's other other electrolytes along the way that we should. So you're saying like the deficiency. Yep. 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 Okay. Yep. okay. Yep. okay. All right, y'all got this. Important concept to know, folks. You gotta know this. You gotta know this. You gotta know this. Okay. Potassium is the major intracellular. So where uh, when we say intracellular, where's that again? Within the cell. Within the cell. This is outside the cell, right? <laughs> So potassium, most, most, uh, major intracellular ion, required for growth, important for nerve conduction, muscle contraction, and acid-based regulation. We'll talk about this again tomorrow. It is a major, major thing for maintenance of normal cardiac rhythm. So when we talk about somebody with hyperkalemia, we're talking about somebody with a high potassium. Their, 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 their problem, their issue in life is too high potassium that creates issues in terms of you as a paramedic and those cardiac rhythms that you're going to treat. Other important functions would include um, glycogen storage. Where's glycogen again? Liver. Liver, right? So it plays a part in that. Um, and skeletal muscles. Again, don't need to know the ranges, but 3.5 to 5.5 is normal range. The terminology is hypo and hyperkalemia. Now, I will tell you that, that it's, it's crazy when you start hearing about those numbers. Uh, because sometimes you're going to hear about potassiums that are 8 and 9 and 10 that are incompatible with life, and yet they're out there. You're going to have those patients with hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. Incompatible with life. Mm -hmm. So they in, they're great, they shouldn't be alive? Um, no, what I'm saying is that when those numbers are that high, that typically they will end up going to cardiac arrest and just die. Okay. You're done with it. Well, I mean... You say they're out there, I mean, it's kind of like um, COPD yep. people that yep. can function at less than yep. Yep. technically anything below like 90 or 90 right. we're not supposed to. And that, that's my point, Charlie, is the fact that you've got some, some patients that should be dead normally, the rest of us will be dead, but these patients somehow can can move, still move around and do relatively well then. Not for long, but they can. What neutralizes the test? So um, you're going to end up giving calcium <coughs> in a pre-hospital setting. In hospital, something a little bit different. They will give. They will give. Um, if it's if it's hypokalemia, they end up giving some potassium for that. And you'll have patients in the pre-hospital setting that will be on potassium. 
take the passing notice thing with that because of that. Hyper, the numbers may go up or down. Say again. Hyper, hyper is going to be high, so you want to, you want to bring it down. So what number uh, we might get into this, but what number do you start seeing the light for? Uh, oh yeah, great question. Um, uh, it, it, it varies from patient to patient, but typically. Typically, when you're getting up to about a six or so, is when you'll see a widening of the QRS. Not, very much. Not a whole lot. You know, you, uh, and again, folks, if you don't realize it already, this is like a tight rain in, in terms of this entire thing. The body is keeping this within a tight rain, and tomorrow when we talk about acid base, we're also going to expand on that, that's within a tight rain. Can I go? Is this why uh, docs call us and then say, hey, this person is coming for an stay or something like that, and they don't want you to really move that patient and they don't want to throw them in. Uh, that, that might be a possibility, yeah. yeah. But we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about some of that more as, as we go on later on. Short of the cardiac rhythm, you see, is there any other things that we could see that would make us think so we're, so, so I hate to do this to you, but we're way too early to talk about that in detail. Okay. If you give me another month, month and a half, we will, we will camp there, okay? Yeah. Fair enough? Yeah. Can I go? Right. Calcium. Calcium requires a blood clotting, bone and teeth, structure, metabolism, normal cardiac function, contraction of muscles, transmission of nerve impulses. What else? Uh, it's kind of up there, but what do you hear about all the time with calcium? Mm -hmm. All about bones, right? So when we hear about osteoporosis, when we hear about, about the osteos later in life, typically we're talking about calcium. And so, again, you can have patients at home. Uh, they're taking calcium every single day because of this very thing right here. Calcium is regulated by the parathyroid gland and renal system. We talked about that back in, in uh, AMP. Alterations in calcium balance can lead to bone and muscle weaknesses, respiratory and cardiac alterations. There's your levels. Hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia. There are times, and we'll talk about later in life, there are times when you would consider giving calcium in a cardiac arrest if you believe that that um, that they're hypocalcemia, and we'll, we'll identify that a little bit later on, Mike. So you give it or hypercalcemia. temperature, regulation, protein and carbohydrate metabolism, and neuromuscular contraction. <coughs> also important in normal cell membrane function and energy source of sodium, potassium, pump. So it's a helper, if you will, in terms of maintaining the sodium, potassium, pump within the cardiac side. Most magnesium is stored within the muscle and the bone, closely associated with phosphate. Uh, it's phosphate a cation or anion. Anions. So the idea, again, that the anions and the cations are closely associated with each other, even though one is positive, the other one is negative charge. What is a neuromuscular contraction? Neuromuscular contraction is going to be within that synapse. Okay, you, so you think about the you're going to, you're going to hear about it later on this afternoon. Within that synapse, it has to cross a a, a, a gap, if you will, in, in terms of making that happen. This plays a part in terms of doing that. You're going to get into it later. You are. You said this is an anion? No, I didn't say that. Oh. I said phosphate mm -hmm. is an anion. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. So calcium and magnesium both work really close with yep. phosphate? Yep. So they're all kind of like yep. a group per se? Um, I wouldn't say a group. I would just say that they, they both have functions without a particular anion. Okay. the negative um, negative side of that. You do know, need to know these three, however. Chloride, major extracellular anion, negative charge balances positive charge of cations. What is this associated with? What did we, what we just get finished talking sodium. about? Sodium, right? So this is the offer, this is the buffer, if you will, to sodium. So this is the, this, they, they both do major things in terms of cardiac side. Okay, so one balances the other. 
Major function uh, to maintain fluid balance and renal function. Normal range, elevated levels, um, acidosis with too much. Too little, retention of water causes the deep. back to the ions and everything else like that, this is going to be one of the, one of the major players in terms of that ion, uh, maintaining that ion balance. Phosphate helps maintain acid-base balance in intracellular space. Important to energy stores closely associated with magnesium, anion, cation. So this is an example, when you think about it, this is an example of sodium bicarb in water, okay? Sodium bicarb, or, or excuse me, um, bicarb, salt, water, the idea that, that sodium bicarb in water will work out in terms of what we're talking about tomorrow across this formula that I will show you tomorrow. Okay, so now Not per se, but it, it, it plays a function in terms of um, keeping ion in a tight level. So, so not not intercellular or anything else like that, but just plays a part in terms of maintaining homeostasis. Okay. So there are also besides these that we're talking about. There's also a whole host of other ones, and, and it's only a small small shoal of what I'm giving you here. Glucose and urea are examples of that. So they're not considered electrolytes, but they still play a part in terms of maintaining this homeostasis, this tight range. You hear about urea or, or urea um, as far as somebody being um, with gout or somebody having renal failure or the likes of. And so that kind of comes back to trying to maintain the same thing. What is urea again? Urea is it's just a, a non, it's, it's a molecule, considered a molecule, doesn't have a particular charge, okay? So remember we talked about the, the neutrons as being no charge at all? That would be the example of this here. And what is the purpose? The, the purpose is it's just to help maintain function across both the cations and the anions. Okay. okay. Are they both proteins? Urea proteins? Uh, I, I, you know, in all honesty, I'd have to go back and look at that. So when we talk about the cell membrane, when we talk about the cell membrane, there are certain things that will go in, there are certain things that they need help in getting in, and that's what Cameron was talking about in terms of different ways that, that fluids and, and solvents will move across the cell membrane, okay? So semipermeable membranes encloses the cell, allowing some substances to, um, to get in while keeping others out. Small molecules, no big problem. Crosses all day long, doesn't have to think about it. There are means of assistance, so let's kind of talk about that. Water is the only substance that passes freely back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all day long. Continuous thing in terms of you not even thinking about it, to maintain homeostasis. 
If you're dehydrated, the idea is going to shift to one side of the cell membrane. If you're overhydrated, it's going to shift to the other side of the membrane in terms of maintaining that homeostasis. Other substances may be too large to pass the membrane. During digestion, these substances are broken down into smaller molecules, which are allowed passage. So the idea in terms of not only do they cross cell membrane, but other means along the way is going to break it down so it can't cross cell membrane. So all by itself, can't pass, but with further breakdown, then it will start crossing cell membrane. Every healthy cell has an outer membrane that separates the cell contents from the fluid that surrounds it. So that intra intracellular, extracellular is what we're talking about there in terms of a healthy cell. We gotta go over what Grace said now. Uh, what do you mean? Well, how does it get broken down? So it, it, it depends on what system we're talking about. Okay. So when I talk about breaking it down, the the example that we give here is about digestion. But in the respiratory system as well, there's a further breakdown in terms of taking air in and, and taking nutrients off and everything else like that. So it depends on which system you're talking about. Okay. All right, so the first one is diffusion. You need to know this. Diffusion is the movement of solutes from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until they're scattered evenly across the cell membrane. <coughs> With diffusion, no energy is required. Examples of this would include oxygen. So a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the respiratory system. We were talking at the, or the, excuse me, the vascular system. We were talking at the cell level that oxygen will cross that cell membrane by diffusion. will pick up um, waste product and take it back to the, to the heart. That's an example of what happens every um, all day long. Diffusion and osmosis move in two different highways. They move across um, two different highways, opposite to each other. Yes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So the the idea, Jerry, is that again, depending on which way that that the teeter totter is is tipping. Um, hyper or hypo, it will shift in opposite directions to that. It's kind of like a <clears throat> like a buddy breather for an air pack. Yeah. These low plug high Yep. And I haven't thought about that, but yeah. And this is a good example of that. The idea that these these, um, these particles or these, these flows, if you will, will go in, in in one direction to balance this off of both sides of the cell membrane. Osmosis, then, is about fluid. It's about solid. So it goes from an area of lesser concentration to an area of greater concentration. Check. And part of the sodium, it can be some other electrolytes as well, but you're right, sodium will be one of the big ones. this in my yep. brain. Essentially, it, regardless of which side of the semipermeable membrane you're on, you're just trying to get to the same ratio. Yep. Yep. Parts per so, this. Exactly. So you want you want even bounds on both sides of the cell membrane is the easiest way to explain. Again, a diagram that shows that in terms of osmosis working in the opposite direction. So there's something that's called osmotic gradient. Anytime you hear gradient, what's going on there? There's a difference. There's like a huge difference on one side versus the other. Okay. So if we're talking about osmosis, which is what we are, osmosis gradient. Even more simply, is fluids to fluid in relationship to the body, isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic. So everything we're talking about. Again, is osmosis and diffusion going in opposite directions 
maintain this balance. When there's a huge gradient, i.e. When it's, when it's huge on one side versus the other, this will go into overdrive in terms of trying to balance this out. So, osmotic gradient is just the direction? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talked about this yesterday, but let's talk about this a little bit, a little bit differently today in terms of uh, um, isotonic versus hyper versus hypo and then osmotic gradient a little bit more. So again, like we talked about yesterday with crystalloids, we, we, we talked about giving fluids that maintains that, um, that isotonic side, okay? Solution has osmotic pressure equal to the normal fluid, fluid uh, body fluid, meaning the solutions are equal on both sides of the cell membrane. So sodium is equal to on one side versus the other. Water is equal to on one side versus the other. Okay? So that gradient is equal. When we talk about hypertonic, we're talking about concentration of the solute is greater on one side of the cell membrane than the other. Water will be drawn into that solution. So it sucks it across the cell membrane in terms of, um, in terms of trying to maintain um, that homeostasis. How careful would you have to be with somebody who's got like six cells? Is, um, that, is that or is that an oxygen? It's an oxygen. Okay. But you're you're right in terms of some other disease processes as far as the body not being able to maintain that. Um, that that it can be real critical. Yep. Yep. So hypotonic then is just the opposite side to that. Um, your CHFers are typically in a hypotonic um, state. One of the things the body will try to do, because of the sodium side of this, one of the things the body will try to do is work on uh, maintaining this back into an isotonic state. But there's a problem in terms of CHFers, as, as we'll learn later in life. So osmotic gradient, again, is the difference between the concentration on one side versus the other, and, and uh, what's created then is these three different things that we're talking about, these three different states that we're talking about. Charlie was a hypotonic solution that we can give us D5W. So that article you had in the view for homework, you talked about it. Now we it okay, so, so, so come see me. Right. We'll, see, we'll see if we can't get that on the straight now. The example that I gave you yesterday on, on, on hypertonic is when you get in hospital, there's a no, whole host of other solutions they can give along the way, IV solutions along the way, that has an effect on this. On the pre hospital side, the medication that we give that creates a hypertonic solution is glucose. So, reading the definition of hydroponic solution, the way I'm understanding this is that we're giving a solution that essentially is going to reestablish homeostasis. Correct. The that's that's where we're after. That's where we're after. However, when you give D50, you're not concerned so much about about maintaining that homeostasis as you are about getting glucose into the bloodstream, and that's essentially that's essentially what what kind of goes on with hydroponic. It's, it's big on one side versus the other side. So when it says for the hypotonic, uh, when the concentration of solute is less on one side than the other, it doesn't necessarily matter what side is less. We're just trying to rebalance. Correct. That's all it's going. To. That's all it is. Okay. So it might be it might be high on solutes. It might be it might be high on solutes and low on, on on solvent on the opposite side, and so they will shift back and forth to maintain that. Thanks. We okay. It depends on which side that we're talking about, okay? If it's outside the cell or inside the cell, the idea that it's going to shift back and forth to maintain that, that homeostasis. 
Because the words that they're saying is into that intracellular compartment, into the extracellular compartment. Okay. So typically, typically that's that's going to be the setup in terms of hyperconic. It's going to be within the cell, coming back across the, the bloodstream in terms of the overall effect. But you're going to also have that going the opposite way. Primarily, it's that. Primarily, it's that. Okay. Okay. Primarily it's that. Uh, no, primarily it's, it's intercellular to the extracellular. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so these three, again, you need to know. Substances are moved across the cell membranes by three other means. So we've talked about osmosis, we've talked about diffusion, let's talk now about three other things. We're going to talk about passive transport, which we, which we basically have with osmosis, right? No energy required. And then active transport and facilitated transport. Passive transport, again, doesn't require energy, water. Active transport, on the other hand, I'll let you write and then we'll talk. I think facilitated is when it actually is it facilitated when something picks it up and then brings it to the yeah, cell nucleus. Like and active is just the pump. Right? I think so. <laughs> no, seriously. They're trying to like correlate words with each other. Yeah. Facilitate. Yeah. An active is like they're moving. <laughs> So I'm active and hyper. It always brings people down. What? Makes no sense whatsoever. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. You put that in the test. You know what? What? You tell me. You tell me what. What's that? Oh, oh, I yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. This, this, this is active. So movement of substances across the cell membrane um, and across the osmotic gradient. Okay, so remember, gradient is like a hill, and so it's pushing it up that hill. And so therefore, anytime we're talking about a gradient, in, in most cases, it's going to need some sort of a helper to move it across that cell membrane. And it's going to play a part in terms of ATP. What did we talk about with ATP a couple weeks ago? It's the fuel. Energy. It's about the energy. It's about the fuel. It's about, the, it's about the, the, the idea that if we don't have ATP, we're in cardiac arrest. If we don't have ATP, we're going to be hypoxic. If we don't have ATP, we're not going to be able to walk. So it's our energy source. So the idea in terms of maintaining that energy source of ATP is about active transport. Um, also capable of releasing energy that will enable the cell to work. Um, so again, it's all, about, it's all about maintaining that. It's faster than diff diffusion. Many molecules that move via um, diffusion also by, move by the way of active transport. So the, I the idea in terms of some of the electrolytes, some of the glucoses, and especially glucose, um, uh, also work off of both passive and active transport. That's all I have. No? Uh, yep. I'm going to clear it up for myself. So active transport is moving cellules or whatever against their concentrated yes. gradient? Yes. So the difference is that osmosis and diffusion require very little energy. This on the other hand is going to be involved in, in pushing things up a hill, osmotic gradient, and certain cells or certain certain things that can't float across that cell membrane without a helper. 
So okay. osmosis and diffusion are passive? Yes. Okay. Yes. Whereas this is go going to require some energy, and that energy is ATP. You're giving up um, ATP in order for this to perform itself. Okay. No big deal. In a normal basis, no, no big deal at all. It happens, happens all the time. But when our patients start getting sick in terms of being in cardiac arrest, let, let's say, there's no, no ATP present, which is part of the reason for us working in cardiac arrest. Okay. okay, so active transport, facilitated diffusion, Facilitated is a helper, right? So facilitated diffusion. We already said diffusion is what? Uh, diffusion all by itself is passive, but diffusion is, is what? What, what? What are we moving with diffusion? Solutes, solutes right? So this is a helper mm -hmm. for solutes in terms of moving across the cell membrane. Specific transport protein is utilized to bind a molecule to transport across the cell membrane. Insulin to glucose mm -hmm. is the most classic one. It's not the only one, but the most classic one. So the only difference is between active and facilitated is active and solvent and facilitated and solvent use? Basically, yes. Okay. It, it's more elaborate than that, but, but it's basic thing, yes. This is where the pumps come in? Yes. Okay. Exactly where the pumps come in. So glucose can move into the cell, it's just not that easy. Correct. So, this so, so here, here's, here's the way I always think about glucose in my pea brain, okay? And that is, remember back to the days of Fat Albert, right? So Fat Albert um, had trouble getting inside of a doorway, right? So Fat Albert had his buddies to push him inside of a doorway, right? That's exactly what this is in terms of insulin having to push the glucose because it's a big old blob across the cell membrane. When we start talking about somebody that is hyperglycemic later on in life, when we talk about that, the fact that they haven't taken their insulin in a number of days, there's no insulin to push the cell membrane um, across that cell, or push the glucose across the cell membrane, so it's just sitting there. It's just sitting there in the system doing absolutely nothing, not getting to where it needs to be. That's the deal in terms of hyperglycemia. That's why it's a big deal. And uh, <clears throat> hypertonic deals with active transport only. It can't deal with hypo. Correct. correct. Okay. And uh, vice versa. Vice versa. Yep. In that example of Pat Albert, his buddies are the facilitated diffusion. Check. So, 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 yeah, so, yeah, yeah the, example, the example I gave, but you're right. I mean, in the end, it, 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 it's buddies to push them across. That's why I gotta, I gotta break it down to my P brain, guys. All right, so. So any questions about, about the blood design? It's brief, and yet it, it, it gets deep in a real hurry, right? So go back and take a look at those things in terms of knowing the differences, knowing the terminology, knowing the cations, the anions, and what they do, and everything else like that, okay? And again, if, if I'm sitting in your seats, folks, come tomorrow morning, you, you want to know this stuff, okay? That will be the basis of where we're starting tomorrow morning, okay? Any questions? So we've already talked about ad nauseum about homeostasis, right? We said that um, the body's the body's determined to maintain its own self, and so the idea, um, the way that it does that with water, as we talked about earlier, is by balancing it between intake and output, intake and output. Several so mechanisms work to, to help maintain that homeostasis. Well, on the intake, this is what we normally take in on a given day. Those of you that those of you that need to study group at a bar, let's say, haven't taken a little bit more on that particular day, but on average, we take in somewhere around 2,500 cc a day. We typically will do that with liquids, with foods, with metabolic sources. The output, guess what, on a normal day is equal to 2,500 cc or 2,500 mils. The way we do that is through our lungs, through our kidneys, through our skin, and through our feces. So let's put this into play for just a wee bit. Do you see any problems in terms of some of our sick patients concerning <coughs> the previous slide in this? Their kidneys are usually bottom or compromised. Okay. So to that, let, 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 me, let me kind of paraphrase what I hear you saying. If you have somebody that's in renal failure and they can't give off urine, they're, they're going to maintain their fluids for, for a long, long time, right? Okay. <laughs> that's the starting point. What else? 
So the idea in terms of this right here, if they're dehydrated for whatever reason, they're not taking fluids in, they're not doing anything along the way, you step in and you end up giving bolus of the fluids along the way to help take care of this. Make sense? Okay. What else can you think of in terms of both intake and output? Well, they might have both things going on, so you have to get both fluids. So give me an example of what you're thinking about. Okay, yeah, that, that, that'd be the perfect one, right? The idea the idea that you're taking fluids in, but you're not necessarily putting them off, is, is going to be a problem on both sides of that, that fence. We see that a lot in geriatrics. Without a doubt, that's the population that we're going to be talking about. Okay? So this intake output is critical in terms of maintaining normalization. So what would the body do in terms of trying to maintain this all by itself, even without you? It's go to a, it'll go to a different source to try and get the intake or go to a different source to try and push the output. So everything we just got finished talking about in, term, in terms of that diffusion and osmosis along the way, the body will go to great degrees in terms of trying to maintain that until it no longer can. So the kicker for you all, the kicker for all of us is this, that most of your patients that are severely dehydrated are not in day one that you end up seeing them or even day two. You see them in day three, day four, to where the body has done its thing for such a long period of time and no longer can, and guess what? Now they're on death's doorstep because of the shock that they're in. So this, this is how you and I kind of interplay with this thing. Typically, we don't see them in the acute phase of, you know what, I just started with diarrhea today and now take me to the hospital. It doesn't typically work that way. The idea that we're talking about days before, before um, you end up seeing them. Gary, can you just explain? I was going to say CHF, that, that I just don't get the problems with intake and outtake at all. You obviously have a problem with outtake because you start getting the or whatever. Where's the intake coming from? So, on CHF, the idea that um, the idea that you have somebody that's not taking enough fluids in does not mean that they're, they're still balanced along the way, okay? The idea that where all that fluid is going to on the CHF is into their tissues. Not through the not through the kidneys itself, but into the tissues itself. So that big old pedoedema that you see is not about the output or anything else like that. It just goes into a different state. You know, we always talk about shock as the loss of fluid. This one obviously talks about an overloading of fluid. What's that term technically? I mean, um, shock is usually a loss of type of fluid. Yeah. So so the, the four different shocks that we're going to be talking about is teratogenic, neurogenic. Um, Terogenic, neurogenic, obstructive, and hyperlink. Okay? So those are the four we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. but, but there's not a particular term of, of shock to that. It's just part of the shock group. Mm -hmm. All four. Both overloading the yep. is yep. Yep. All right. So something you should already know. This should be like bread and butter to you already. But the idea in terms of signs and symptoms that somebody is dehydrated. To include dry mucous membranes, to include poor skin turgor, to include excessive thirst, to include uh, tachycardia and hypotension, to include orthostatic hypotension. What is that? So a difference in vital signs between laying down, sitting up, and standing up, right? So it, yep. So so the idea in terms of vital signs that change based on the position of your patient are all signs and symptoms of somebody that is dehydrated. When we're talking about kids, because they're not going to operate and, and talk to you and say, you know what, I'm dehydrated today, do something for me. Mm -hmm. doesn't work that way, right? You walk in, and these kids are lethargic. Um, you walk in, and mom reports that dry diaper that is normally wet. You walk in, and you hear about the fact that this child's been um, having diarrhea over the past day or so. Sunken fontanelles, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, sunken fontanelles is associated in part about dehydration. So that anterior fontanelle that we talked about last week is in part an indicator here of dehydration. Crying without tears, capillary refill greater than two seconds are all signs of symptoms in the pediatric population of dehydration. And by the way, where you and I can compensate for this to the F degree, these kids will die within 48 hours or so, sometimes less, sometimes more, 48 hours or so in terms of being dehydrated. You can play a part in this in terms in terms of what we're going for. And that's my spiel.
a lot of stuff there in a short period of time. Do yourself go back and do yourself a favor, go back and take a look at it in, in, in detail. You're going to need to. Questions at all? It's 10 o'clock straight up, come on back at 10 after. <laughs>